So CES 2022 was, oh, it was an interesting one. It was really not what you expect. And although a lot of big companies bailed, like for obvious health reasons, many other companies still went. And in this video, we're gonna talk about nine big things that I saw at CES that I think are really going to be influential in the next year, in the next couple of years. And these are things that we're gonna break down in three main categories. One of them is going to be tech that is already real, that I think is going to be really exciting, that, that you can buy now. The second one is tech that I think is going to come out very, very soon. And the third one is more of concept tech in general because CES is the consumer electronic show, right? But, but the C and the S kind of balance, right? Like as consumers, we go there so that brands can show us what they're making, but brands go there and show us what they're making so that they can see the reaction from consumers. So not all products there are actually going to be real. A lot of them might be for marketing, as we'll talk about with some of the really cool cars that came out. And other ones might just be like bouncing ideas off the wall, like some of the smart glasses I'm gonna talk about. And they just wanna see like how people react, which ones are more interesting and get that customer feedback before actually making any production units. Now, like I said, there are nine things I'm gonna talk about in this video, nine really categories. And as I kind of mentioned right there, the first one is going to be smart glasses. I saw a lot of different smart glasses around there. This is something that we've started to see a lot even outside of CES in the past year where people are using, where they're making more smart glasses, but so far it's mostly just like audio-based stuff, right? Like Bose has some, we've got Razer has some, there's a lot out there, Amazon made their own. And they're just like sunglasses that, or regular reading glasses that have a little speaker and, and maybe a microphone. But at CES, I saw, saw some that kind of took a different approach and were really more of augmented reality. I tried some on, they were honestly really cool. But what I thought is really interesting is that it seems like we're still at least maybe two or three years out from actually getting a pair of good smart glasses. People talk rumors about the Apple glasses, things like that. I think it's still going to be a little while until we actually see something like that for a couple reasons. One, the industry right now is really only good at making the speaker glasses. Two, they're putting cameras on some like the Snapchat spectacles and the face, like Facebook made some with Ray-Ban and they, they got some weird, like honestly not so great reviews. People said the cameras weren't that great. It wasn't quite, quite ready to be that small. And then the third approach, or there's really four approaches. The third approach is having something that's augmented reality, showing things in front of you, which is really hard to do well. Google Glass made that honestly ahead of their time, but, but it, they were, it was big and it was chunky and it was not the best. And then the fourth one, which I think is probably going to be the next one that we see really start to catch on, is not so much for augmented reality, but rather just sort of acting like a VR headset. It's like you can put these on, you can see things around you, but it'll project something. You can watch a movie, you can watch TV on there. And instead of having a projector or a giant TV, like everybody could be hanging out in the living room just watching Netflix on, on their glasses. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's like a, a good future, but, but I think it's something that we're probably gonna see. Number two, this is one that I talked a lot about on my Instagram. If you guys follow me, you know this. If you don't, my Instagram's at Mike O'Brien with, with two N's because one end was taken. But anyway, this is the chore robots. I've seen, I've seen so many robots around CES that are supposed to help you in your house do different chores. Like Samsung announced one last year and they had it again this year, but so many other brands, like I can't even name the number. It was, it was it probably a dozen different brands had robots that would drive around. Some of them would just kind of follow you and you could like set things on them. Some of them had little robotic arms, some of them vacuumed, some of them were snow plows or snow blowers rather. Like there were so many different little home automation robots and I'm not sure how soon we're actually gonna see this. And I think this is really an interesting one to keep an eye on because I asked, I polled people on Instagram and asked like what you guys think of this and I'll, I'll ask you here as well to leave a comment below. But with these, I think this is really cool. I think that if done right, uh, like something that could wash my dishes, for example, or at least load my dishwasher, I think would be really convenient because that's just time that I could spend doing other things. But at the same time, like I know it's only a matter of time before it puts like a picture frame in the dishwasher because it, it thinks it's a plate, right? So it's still kind of, like it's not quite ready yet, but that was a really interesting and really promising thing that I could see. But a lot of technology like this might actually start off with people who need special assistance. Maybe somebody who is in a wheelchair, maybe somebody who has limited mobility, and it might be harder to carry things around. Like having a little robot that can help with the chores could be a really great way to spend more time in your life in your actual home and not having to go to something like a nursing home or other kind of caregiver, or hire a caregiver. Like it could be a really positive part of the future that's not necessarily widespread adoption for the everyday family yet, 
but I could see in the next couple years some very specific use cases such as that that would really maybe catch on. And that brings us into category number three. This one is no surprise. This is the car category because we've seen so many cars coming out. This was without a doubt the electric car boom year where every single manufacturer out there was announcing new electric cars, announcing their goals for their 2025 fleets, 2030 fleets. Like everybody wants to have an electric future. It's really obvious that things are trending that way. And so having a lot of that at CES, it's really no surprise that that was one of the highlights in many categories. Like for example, BMW attracted a lot of people with their color changing car. And yes, I'll talk more about that. The color actually does change, but they had a lot of electric cars. They were letting people test drive them. Like everybody wanted to showcase their electric cars, their self-driving technology, their AI, all of that stuff was all across the entire show. But before we get too much into that, the, the color changing car. Like that was one of the big highlights of this entire show. Like I said, this is something that like some brands used as kind of a marketing thing. And whether or not we're actually going to see cars that change colors, I don't know. But it was cool enough that it got a lot of headlines and a lot of people were talking about BMW as being like kind of a front runner in the CES this year for some of the coolest tech. And I think that was a big win for, for BMW there. But talking about how it actually works, I checked it out. This car, it looked really cool. It was honestly like, you could tell it was a bit, it was a pre-production unit. It was a little bit wrinkly every now and then. It wasn't perfectly smooth, but it had a ton of these little tiny triangles that used essentially e-ink technology to change between mostly white and mostly graphite blackish, right? So you could easily change between the two of them and have any pattern you want. Like it looked really, really cool. Again, I don't know where people would actually end up using this, but it's something that really drew, drew a lot of attention. But while we're on the subject of the BMW cars, they had a lot to say about their interior experience. One of the big things that we saw, not just electric, not just self-driving and not just color changing, the interior experience of cars is getting better and better. And it's really going to be like the back seat. They have basically a full movie theater back there. I was in there and it had a full screen that went basically the full width of the car and they had speakers in the seat. They called it 4D just because it's like speakers in the seat, extra cool dimension that it felt really cool when you're watching. It was, it was really immersive. And honestly, if I had one of those, I would probably go out in my garage and watch movies in my car just because it was such a cool immersive experience. And that leads me into kind of a theme that I noticed throughout the show, and that is that there's a lot of cross-pollination between brands. Brands are not just doing one thing as you might expect. Like car companies are making entertainment systems and really good ones at that. And then entertainment system companies are now making cars. Like Sony had, had two cars at the show that honestly looked really, really nice. I didn't see them driving around or anything, but, but looking at the cars, like, they were just some of the many, honestly, a lot of them kind of look similar. They're all really sleek and kind of like a Tesla. And, and that's barring a couple kind of outliers where you had some cars that had crazy specs or crazy use cases. Like for example, cars that promised to go 600 miles on a single battery charge. Well, they were shaped a little bit differently because they wanted to be more aerodynamic. Or on the flip side, cars that were really, really tiny, only had one passenger, had a door on either side, and, and were really meant for just getting around town. Technically, they're classified as a motorcycle. They had only 100 miles of range, but I could see that being a cheap, affordable way that people would really like to get around a tight city. Like if you live in Queens, that might be the perfect vehicle for you. So there were a lot of really cool things like that that I noticed throughout the show. All right, now, so far, those categories are things that are really cool tech that is probably coming in the future, but we don't know exactly when these things are going to ship. Getting into something that we do know is real and is going to ship, the first thing is the chips. We have a lot of processors on here, of course, crazy silicon shortage right now, but, but there are a lot of processors that were announced. For example, for example, Snapdragon's 12th generation chips are supposed to be, according to them, substantially faster than anything else on the market, including Apple's M1 chips. But it comes with a catch. They didn't really focus too much on, on battery life and they're still using a lot of the same architecture, which means that even if it is more powerful, you're either going to need a bigger battery or you're going to compromise and have a shorter battery life in general. I think that's still exciting that they're doing that. Like it's better than not making it faster at all. Having something that's a lot faster, mostly because they have more cores in there, is still something that's great because like, let's say this, if you don't want to spend a ton of money on a new M1 MacBook Pro, like they're, they're expensive, right? Maybe instead you'd buy a 12th gen Intel processor on some Windows laptop, it would be a lot cheaper. And then maybe you just have to plug it in a little bit more. But if you're somebody who's editing videos or you really need that horsepower, 
that could be something that is a great solution for you. Additionally, AMD is coming out with a couple more of theirs, the 7000 desktop chip and the 6000 series mobile chip. Uh, so those, again, are going to be really better for the gamers out there that are looking for the great graphics that you're going to be seeing in the next year. Uh, again, like the M1 Max is like, you know, people tried gaming on it. It's, it, it can do it, but it, it's kind of weird because it's not, it's not Windows. Now that leads us into the next category. Again, another one that is tangible, something that we are going to be seeing this year. These are products that were announced in the category of laptops. And the first one, probably the most exciting out of these in my opinion, is the Dell XPS Plus. This is something that I think a lot of people are going to end up buying. The Dell XPS series always crushes it as one of the best compact Windows laptops. And this one is going to have kind of some different things on here. One of them being a touch bar on the top. I don't know why they got rid of buttons. I prefer buttons and, and the touch bar kind of is like a compromise where you get the worst of both worlds. Like you get everything that you didn't like about Apple's touch bar, but you don't get the customization that you had on Apple's touch bar. So it's kind of like buttons that you can't press. But regardless, something I did like, or I think is going to be interesting is the trackpad, which is basically invisible. Not only does it look cool, but I think it kind of unlocks a lot of opportunities for future design iterations to kind of not have such a physical trackpad and make it a little bit more based on haptics. We'll see where this actually goes. Additionally, we saw laptops that kind of expanded even further on what Apple did with the little touch bar on the top, where instead they had like a second display where the number pad would go. And this could be doing really whatever you want. I think this is actually probably the coolest one where if you're able to use maybe like a pencil, for example, instead of having to sign documents by sending it to a tablet or, or folding your laptop back, like having a space where the number pad goes you could use for a pencil or a pen, like I think that's a huge opportunity that laptops should really be pursuing. And then, Another way that laptops are kind of being redesigned is with a folding display in general. So we have the ASUS 17-inch foldable laptop. I don't really know how it's going to feel to be typing on a just straight up tablet, but you know, it's something that could be really cool. If you want a big media experience, you open it up. If you need something more foldable, like more of a, a laptop, it folds compact and you can use it like a laptop. And remember again that I said CES was a combination of those three things. I would say that this foldable laptop is probably more of getting consumer reactions and seeing what people actually think about that style. But we also saw some new concepts for foldable phones, which I think are definitely going to be much more exciting once the technology really proves out. And again, this is a little bit more on the prototype side here. As far as phones go, we already know that we've got like the, the flip and the fold, like two different ways of folding the phone. But even then, like when you open or close it, let's look at like the Galaxy Z Fold 3. When you open it, it's kind of like a weird aspect ratio. It's not wide like a normal laptop and it's not tall and narrow like a phone. So it just, things are like, it's nice to have, but I wish it folded a third way. So if you had like folded three way trifold, then you'd have a nice wide tablet. Or if you fold it up, you have a normal tall phone style. And if you wanted something square, maybe you could partially unfold it. And we did see some devices like that this year. I think that that is really going to be the future once we continue to make the technology thinner and batteries better. The next category, I think you'd probably guess if you're thinking of consumers and electronics, like it, it's TVs. And there were no shortage of TVs at CES this year. All different types of displays and designs and the way they worked, like there were so many differences. TVs that rotated on a motor that could do different things. And of course there was mini LED, micro LED, quantum dot, all these different displays that are going to be brighter and overall give you a better media experience. But on top of that, there were also some really cool sound bars. Like Samsung came out with a new sound bar that is really, really thin. Like this thing is barely an inch by an inch, maybe two inches by two inches. It's absolutely tiny, very, very slim. And it's going to give you like obviously more shelf space in front of your TV and a smaller footprint. And it comes in several colors, so it looks really nice as well. And from experiencing it, granted it's in their nice sound room, it sounded really good. It was surprisingly good quality for how incredibly small it actually was. So that's something I think we're definitely going to see as a trend, better sound on thinner devices that are either built into the TV or as a sound bar below that can look really nice as well. And of course we can't forget within TVs, not everything is going to be a TV. There's also projectors. And there were a lot of short throw laser projectors that sit like 12 inches from the wall and they can project up. And, and honestly, they do a really good job even in daylight now. But the one that I thought was especially cool, and you guys probably already saw my video, this was the Samsung Freestyle, a small little device that it's completely like, I don't know, it, in my opinion, I think it really rethinks the way projectors work, but it's kind of more of like a, a smart speaker redesigned in a way where this thing is mobile. You can bring it when you're camping, you could have it in your kitchen, home gym, uh, anywhere you want. It screws into a light bulb socket. You can set it up and connect it to a battery, plug it into the wall. Like it's really, really very flexible, which is why I think it was aptly named the Freestyle. And it projects at 1080p from, you know, pretty much any distance. You can get uh, anywhere from a 
30 inch to up to a 100 inch display. I mean, technically you can make it bigger, it's not going to look quite as good or really be in focus, but, but still, that was something that, well, okay. I'm gonna get off topic talking about that in this video. If you guys wanna see that, I'll link it down below or put a card up there to that video. I think it's probably the most exciting thing that I would recommend buying within the next year from CES announcements this year. And then of course we have the phones. OnePlus announced their 10 Pro, which is going to come to China first. We don't know exactly when it's coming to the US and, and it, it's a cool looking phone. It looks a lot like the S21 with the little wrap around camera bump, but I'm sure it's going to be a very impressive phone. I used the OnePlus 9 Pro for a while this year. I always really liked that phone. I love their software. Doing a little bit of a change this year going to color OS, but, but again, I, we're, I can't really talk much more about that until we actually see that in person. What we did see at CES that is already for sale is the Samsung Galaxy S21 FE, selling at $699. And this is one that, again, mixed reviews on this. Last year, the S21 or S20 FE was an absolute hit. Everybody loved it. It hit the perfect price. But now it's a little bit more of a crowded space from the Pixel 6 selling at that price to also last year's S21 selling at that price. Like it's a little bit harder to justify a 699 phone. I think if it was 599, this would have been an easy recommendation, but it's giving you like some flagship specs and also quite a few compromises. Again, if you guys want a video about the full, like every all my thoughts on the S21 FE, leave a comment below and I, I can review that for you guys. But it's something that I think Anyone who's looking to buy that, I would probably wait and see what the S22 series actually looks like because there's a chance it might be just another $100 and you can get a newer S22 that has a more, less compromise, we'll just say that. So that's my take on CES 2022. It was definitely a strange year because a lot of brands didn't go and because of that, a lot of tech reviewers didn't go and so it was, it was a lot emptier. But there were still a lot of really cool things that I enjoyed looking at and I think it's, it's gonna be an exciting year in tech. As long as we kind of fix the shortages with, with chips and things like that, I think we are going to see a lot of big innovations this year and I'm excited, but leave a comment below and let me know what from CES you're most excited about and what you think is going to be the biggest flop of the year. I don't know, I just think that's kind of interesting. If you enjoyed this video, as always, consider liking and subscribing. I'm Mike O'Brien, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Oh yeah, by the way, sorry if the audio is like not great. I'm obviously filming in a hotel with a lav mic, uh, but it is what it is.